Greetings and welcome back to another episode of Afro Plus Low modding tutorials and in today's video I'm gonna show you how to add new enemies and bosses to the game. So let's get right started. The first thing that we have to do is open our content folder and in there we find the entities2.xml file. If you just open this up, again this, is, this has a bunch of properties and some of them are very easily understood like base HP but some of others are a bit confusing and this is the exact same file that we used for our familiars. The difference is that in this case we'll be using this file to encode what our enemies, what is collision radius is, how much damage it does, how much HP it does, and basically which animation file it uses. In this case, if you just go kind of step by step, the first thing that I do is load the animation file. And you can see that the animation file is located under GFX, which if you go back to our content folder, you can find that it's in resources. GFX and in here is my animation file. I just used one from the game which already exists because it has all of the animations. The only thing I did change is the sprite sheet of Rock Mega, so now it's, he's a bit more green. But obviously you can make your own animation file with your own sprite sheet so you can make your total new custom enemies. In this case you can treat this as a new custom enemy, just the same file, maybe just, just the same look as, as an already existing enemy because basically I'll be doing everything from scratch. The next thing here is base HP and this just tells us how much base HP that enemy has. In this case it just has 10 HP, no particular reason, I decided to set that low so I can kill them rather quickly as I'm testing them. The next one is whatever that is a boss or not and whatever it is a boss you have to set this to 1 and if it's not a boss you would set this to 0 and if this is 1 meaning it is a boss then you would set this boss ID to whatever number. One thing that you kind of have to keep in mind with IDs in general because if it is a boss you would set this ID and if it's not a boss you would set this ID. Um, these IDs correlate to IDs which already exist in the game. So let's say that the hopper ID is 10. I'm not really sure it is, but let's just pretend it is for the time being. If it's 10, if you set this ID to 10, that means that this particular enemy will act exactly like hopper does. It will use all of the same animation files and, and the names. It will use basically the same AI. So you can kind of make variations of the same enemy if you set this particular ID to the same ID of the enemies which already exist in the game. If you want to make your own custom unique ID, like like I, I would or like I will, I'm just using one that is above all of the IDs of the enemies which already exist in the game but is still lower than a thousand. If your ID is a thousand or over that is treated then as an effect and if it's treated as an effect that means it has no collision and for that reason you can't really use those as enemies. I mean you could use them theoretically but it's just kind of more elegant if you just use the IDs between the maximum ID of the enemies and below a thousand because in there lies basically your own ID. You might be wondering, won't that mean that if two people with different mods use the same ID, won't they, won't they kind of clash together? And they will, and that's kind of a problem, and I think that's something that they will probably address in the future. But for the time being, you, you're really kind of limited into how many new enemies you can actually add to the game. So besides that, we have a few other attributes, which I won't really go into much detail, but essentially we can set if it's a champion, you can set its collision damage, so how much damage it actually does when it collides with you. Collision mass kinda is a physics based thing, so how much mass it has when it actually hits you, how much it bounces around and things like that, and basically a bunch of other parameters. And I would recommend, this, these are not all the parameters that exist, but I would recommend if you go into the game, into the resources folder, and if you unpack them, you can find a bunch of other examples there of enemies which already exist in the game and you can kind of take those and play around with it and obviously this all of these parameters depend on how you want your particular enemy to act and maybe how much damage you want it to have. Maybe another thing I really want to point out is the stage HP variable and you, you don't really have to set variable HP but some enemies exist in the game which basically gain more HP the larger or maybe the longer that the run has gone on and you can use this stage HP with tandem with base HP the kind of add on top of how much HP there is. So I believe if you set this to 5, that means that this particular entity will have 5 more HP on every consecutive stage. So let's say that in you, if you saw this enemy in basement 1, and if this was 5, in basement 1 it would have 10 HP, but in basement 2 then it would have 15 HP, and then of course in depth 1 it would have 15 HP. Yeah, I think I said that right. So, so, so you can see that there's a bunch of variability here and obviously you can have your own champion variants. You can make new variants of already existing enemies if you just set the ID the same and then just change the variant. And that means that those enemies can spawn into the game as champions of the, those particular enemies. So that was maybe too much of entities to the XML. So let's jump right into the code and I'll explain you what's going on there. 
Welcome to the code and the first thing that we do here is just register the mod and save that in our local variable called mod. And the next thing that we do here is just get the entity type by name called bandage dude and that is just the name that I set in the entities entities2.xml file. And in this case what you have to kind of keep in mind is that it cannot have any spaces in between. For some reason if we have spaces in this particular field things get buggy and when I did my familiars video I noticed that things just don't work if you have any spaces in there. So to kind of just stay safe, just in case you didn't patch it yet, I just decided to stick with one string of letters without any spaces in between. And essentially what this function gives us is the ID of that particular entity and saves it in the bandage dude type variable. One thing that you kind of have to do with this one or maybe that I notice a lot of people do wrong is that you kind of have to use the callbacks correctly and the correct callback for any MPC updates or for any AI is MC MPC update and for this reason this is kind of important because a lot of people use MC post update and there's nothing really wrong with that because obviously you can make a lot of things uh, in a lot of different ways. But in this particular case is if you want to have a lot of new enemies, if you tie it to the post update, then you kind of have to loop to every entity in the room, then you only apply your logic to one particular entity and I think it can get really messy really fast. A more elegant approach is to use this callback and just have a function dedicated function for your particular entity. I just named my update and then the third parameter is to which particular entity you want your update function to be called. In this case I just say whenever bandage dude is in the room call the update function and will be only calling this function when that particular entity exists in the room. So that's a bit maybe a more elegant way of doing things because this way you can have a, a lot of enemies in the game and a lot of different AIs and it won't really lag your game as much if you have it with a post update just because that means that this particular function will be only called when that particular entity exists in the room. So if you go in our update function which is kind of our main logic function where we apply our logic and we have one parameter here and this is just bandage dude, I name it bandage dude and essentially this is an entity a class, an entity class, an entity object of whichever entity we are trying to apply the logic for. In this case, because I said bandage root type, we're only getting the bandage dude entity and I just named it appropriately to be maybe a bit more clear when you're actually going to the code. So when we have our particular entity then we can manipulate it in a lot of different ways. And the first thing I do is just get the player and then I get the sprite of that particular entity. And the sprite in this case is from the sprite class and the sprite class has a few nifty functions that you can use to kind of play the animations of just your entity from the animation file. In this case because I used the animation file from an already existing game what you can do is open the animation editor just drag that file right in there and on the right you'll see a bunch of different animation names and if you're still a bit confused you can go to my how to animate video and kind of check how, how to get things from there and so essentially there's a bunch of different functions or maybe a few animations in that case. Uh, the first one is appear so that is when you when this particular entity appears. The one is walk so that is its idle animation as it's kind of moving around. One animation is rebirth and then the fourth animation is attack 0.1 and I'm just really gonna go in detail what these do. Essentially they just signify what they mean and I just picked ones that looked appropriate, obviously this is a, a, a lot more dependent on you and what you feel is right and maybe what the names say, so, so this is kind of my artistic interpretation of those particular names. Nevertheless, as we get into there, the bandage root state, so a state is a new kind of property of an entity which depends or tells us what this particular entity is doing when he's spawned into the game. And when this particular entity is spawned into the game, we just say that his state is state initialization and that means that this particular variable or maybe value of this one is zero so that means that this entity has just spawned into the game and what we do is play the animation of a pair and this is just an animation I think every enemy has some enemies poof into the game some enemies kind of calm down some enemies do other things and essentially we just play this particular animation and we change the state of this bandage dude to NPC state state move and we're just saying okay now that the bandage dude has appeared in the game we're telling him to start moving around. Great. The next function or the next if statement here checks whatever our bandage dude is actually moving and in this case I, I just have a debug text saying that we're in the state move and then we just play the walk animation and the walk animation in this case is just him kind of floating around just kind of gives him a bit more character so he's not just stationary there and then what I do is kind of randomize an attack and in this case I coded two attacks for him and one attack is that he spits a spider and the other one is that just he shoots below him so that's a very basic example maybe but I hope you get a point across on how to actually manipulate with the states. 
And then I just generate a random number. So this happens every frame, remember, or at least every NPC update. I generate a number, and if that particular number is below two, so it, if it's just one, I just change his state to NPC state attack, and I change the state frame to zero. And state frame is basically a counter that keeps time of how long your particular entity has been in a particular state. And then the second one, if the random attack is above two and below five, we just state his NPC state attack two. So this is essentially another state attack, it's just a second one. So in this case, because he has two attacks, I'm just using both NPC states to kind of go along with it. Of course, what you could do is just set your own numbers here. I'm just deciding to use the NPC states which are in the enumerations file for, for kind of continuity sake and to kind of keep track of just what it's doing. It's much more descriptive to say NPC state state attack because everyone who's looking at the code will say okay this enemy is attacking now as opposed to saying something like zero or one which doesn't really convey a lot of information. So in this case when we have the NPC state attack then we check if our bandage dude is in state NPC state attack and if it is we check if the state frame is zero so that means that the particular state has just started and if it is we just play the animation of one particular enemy in this case I just so, say rebirth because we're spawning enemies and we're kind of rebirthing them it's a bit convoluted but nevertheless and then what i do is just do some math and then i spawn a spider at bandage dude's position and this is what i do at the start of the animation and then what i do basically because remember this is called every single frame i increment the state frame as in saying that uh that now we are kind of progressing through the state frame we won't be spawning any more entities. Obviously, if I want to spawn more spiders, you can do so. But in this case, I decided to spawn just one spider. And then we just check if this particular sprite or this particular animation rebirth is finished, then we just stay changing back to state move. And essentially what this means is that as we enter the state, we'll spawn a spider, the whole animation will play out, and as soon as it finishes, and this function will tell us when it finishes, we just change the state back to NPC state move, and then we just state, set the state frame to zero, in indicating that we have restarted a new state. NPC state state attack 2 works very, very similarly. In this case, what we do, if the state frame is zero, we just play the animation of attack 0 0.1, 0 0.1, not 0 0.1, and I just say, if bandage state frame divided by 3, is zero, so that means that essentially every third frame, when this function is called, will be spawning a projectile. So that means, if you imagine how this particular function works, let's say that the animation of attack 0, 1 is 30 frames long, when we get into it, this is zero, and then we say is zero divided by three remainder zero, and it is, we just spawn a projectile. And then this function is called again, state frame increases increments by one, then it's one, and it's two, and it's three, and when it's three, we shoot another tier, and then it's five, and then it's, um, and then it's four, and then it's five, and then it's six, and this is true again, and we shoot another tier. So essentially, this is like doing a multiple versions of something. Of course, you can just kind of remove this if statement at all, but then he'll be shooting a lot, a lot of projectiles. And if you're kind of wondering about the math here, what I do is just generate a random angle between 1 and 180, and that's essentially every angle below him. And then I just generate a random magnitude, so the projectiles have different speeds. And then I just use a function called vector.fromAngle, and I just get a vector from a particular angle, in this case from 1 and 180, and then I just multiply that vector by wh whichever magnitude we generated. And of course, as soon as this animation is finished, we just change that back to NPC state move, and I just reset his state frame to zero. And at the end, I just have this called move logic, and move logic essentially handles moving for me. So he kind of moves around and he moves around as he plays all of these animations, so he's not just a stationary enemy in this case. And the move logic is a very simple one, I just pass this particular entity in the parameter and the NPC. First of all, I generate the angle, which is again 13060. This essentially means that he can move in any direction around him. And then I just get a direction vector, which again is a function vector dot from angle. And then I check if he's low, if he's not moving. So if he's very, very slow, if he's not moving, then I just add a velocity in this random direction. So essentially what this means is that he will dash, he will stop, he will dash again, he will stop, and essentially he will dash in random directions. And because of how this particular entity works, that means that he will collide with walls and things like that, but won't collide with enemies. No, he will collide with enemies. So essentially I'm saying that collision will, will work, and we're just adding velocity, um, essentially making him dash around. So if you go into the game, I'll show you how this actually works. Welcome to the game, and the first thing, if you want to look at our enemies, actually spawn him in. So if you just say spawn bandage dude, you can see that he already exists in the files. And if you just spawn him in, you can see that essentially it's like a ragman, ragmega, he's just a bit more green. 
And you can see that he does have contact damage and he does have a few of the decks that I was talking about. So the first state attack is just when he kind of randomly sprays below him. And you can see that in between he still dashes around, which is kind of the intended strategy. And you can see that his movement pa pa pattern is like he dashes and he stops and then he dashes again. And in between there's a random chance that he actually executes an attack. And in this case you can see that some of the attacks are him shooting below him and some of the attacks are just him spawning spiders. Maybe the animations are not the most appropriate don't really indicate what's going on but nevertheless I hope you can see what I was going with it and obviously if you have your own enemy you can make your own animations and you can kind of tinker around with that. So you made it to the end of this video as well and one thing that I haven't covered is how to add new enemies and bosses to existing rooms or maybe how to make new rooms and include them into the game. The first reason is I'm not really sure if that is possible. I'm sure that there is probably some workaround of doing that but I'm not sure if there's like a legit way of, of, of introducing these rooms into the game. Another part is that we really don't have a lot of control over floor generation or over room generation and for that I'm kind of waiting or hoping that Nicholas and the team will be adding those tools to the game and then maybe I can make a, continu a continuation video on top of that and when that happens be sure I'll be sure to be on the lookout to see maybe there are elegant ways of introducing new bosses and enemies into the rooms and if there is I'll be sure to let you know but I'll definitely make a video on floor generation and room generation when that particular feature comes out and I hope it does because I think that can make that can allow us to make some really cool things like alternative floors obviously adding more art uh, and, and even manipulating the floors in very subtle ways like adding more curse rooms or maybe ma making the floors longer or maybe forcing the game to add more giant rooms but for now that's still in the realms of impossibility so we can't really do that but I hope that we will be soon. Anyway I hope you enjoyed this one guys and I hope to see you next time.